Okay, so today we're going to be making a new type of video, which is the Ask Me Anything video, where I will be answering your question about data science and bioinformatics. And without further ado, we're starting right now. Okay, so let's take a look at the question. So the first question asked by Shubangi is, I want to learn drug design and implement machine learning models for the same. Please guide me. So before talking about how we can apply machine learning to drug design, let's give a little perspective because one of the common questions that I'm being asked on the channel and also on LinkedIn is, if I want to apply artificial intelligence or machine learning, what are some of the steps that I will need to do in order to develop a new drug? So in order to answer that question, let's have a look at the general drug discovery process. So actually, let's take a look first at the playlist and go to the bioinformatics project. And so you're gonna be seeing that there are a total of 13 videos in this playlist. So I have a bioinformatic from scratch series where I go into specific detail on how you could get started in collecting a novel data set in bioinformatic, particularly for computational drug discovery. So you will be collecting, compiling your own unique data set against a target protein of interest. And then in the subsequent video, we will be talking about how to calculate molecular descriptor in order to describe the molecule. And finally, we will be building a predictive model that will be able to, as you guessed, predict the biological activity or the inhibition of the enzyme activity. So that might sound a bit gibberish. So in order to understand that, I will recommend you to watch the two hour and a half video lecture that I have made on the computational drug discovery. Okay, so in order to answer the question by Chubangi on how to apply machine learning into drug design, so let's take a look at the drug discovery process. So the lecture that I was talking about, the two hour lecture here, computational drug discovery, it is based on this PowerPoint presentation. So let's go over to slide number seven, where we will be taking a look at the drug discovery process. So one of the first steps that is required in order to design a new drug is to come up with a new target protein of interest. For example, if you wanna cure cancer, a particular type of cancer like breast cancer, so the first thing is to come up with the target protein that you want to target. By targeting, it means that we wanna find inhibitors or compound that will be able to bind to the protein or the target protein that is implicated in breast cancer. So in order to know which target protein is involved in the biochemical pathway that is related to breast cancer, we must first understand the biochemistry of that. And so the first thing that you will have to do is to hit the books in biochemistry and look at the biochemical pathway and how the proteins are interacting within the pathway and what substrate that they are binding to and what end product that they are producing, which will lead to downstream effect that will essentially or eventually lead to the accumulation of some molecule in the body that will lead to the disease itself. So for example, in breast cancer, the accumulation of estrogen molecule will lead to tumor cell growth because the overproduction of estrogen will be the precursor for tumor cell growth in the breast. And so therefore, in order to prevent that from happening, we will need to limit the amount of estrogen that is being generated. So in order to do that, we have to look at the biochemical pathway. And after doing that, which could involve doing several studies, like for example, knockout experiment, where we will be genetically knocking out a particular gene, like for example, the aromatase gene, and seeing whether that helps to eliminate the generation of the estrogen, okay? And so if it has already been demonstrated that the knocking out of specific gene leads to the reduction of, for example, the production of estrogen, then the next step would be to 
find inhibitors or compounds that will be able to bind to the aromatase enzyme. And so aromatase enzyme is in fact a target protein for breast cancer. And the aromatase enzyme is a type of cytochrome P450 enzyme, which is a pretty big family, and it is involved in the production of estrogen. So actually, I have published several papers on the discovery of novel drug or biomolecule that will be able to bind to the aromatase and exert their inhibitory property or modulatory property that will prevent the overproduction of estrogen. Okay, so the first step, as I've mentioned, is to identify the target protein that will be able to modulate the disease. And so if you're coming from a field not from biology, then you probably would have to collaborate with someone who is in biology in order for them to explain to you about biochemical pathway and which one is a lucrative target to approach for applying machine learning in order to tackle this problem. So in just a moment, I'm going to tell you how you could exactly apply machine learning for drug discovery. So once you have identified a target protein that you want to target, and so the next step would be to perform some screening experiment. So this could be either experimental screening or computational screening. So a experimental screening will involve performing a high throughput or low throughput screening whereby you subject a chemical library that you have. It could be a couple thousand of compound or it could be a handful of compound like maybe 10, 20 or 100 compounds. And then you would test the inhibitory properties of the compound against the target protein of your interest. And compounds that are able to inhibit the target protein with the specified potency or binding property, meaning that it has, for example, the IC50 or KI value less than a particular threshold value. So for example, in most of our research work, we would consider compounds having activity of less than 1000 nanomolar to be very potent. Okay, so that constitute the HIT identification. Okay, so the screening experiment will allow you to identify the hit compounds. And once you have identified the hit compound, you want to optimize the hit compound. So you have to convert the hit to the lead. And then optimizing of the compound will be called lead optimization. And lead optimization will be involving the use of medicinal chemistry. And so that means that you will particularly be substituting various functional groups in the molecule, for example, by performing bioisosteric replacement, whereby you will be replacing specific functional group in the molecule with a comparable functional group. So in chemistry, a functional group is essentially a collection of atoms. Like for example, OH would constitute a hydroxy group or COOH would constitute a carboxylic acid or NH2 would constitute amine. And so the thing is, you will be replacing a negatively charged functional group with another comparable negatively charged functional group. And then you will be observing whether that give rise to better activity or not. Or you could change the position of the functional group. Like for example, it might be present at position number one, but then you will be changing it to position number two or even position number three or number four. So that require you to pretty much modify the connectivity of the atoms or the functional group within the molecule. And so the alteration of the molecule by means of medicinal chemistry will lead to a large collection of analog, compound analog. By analog, I mean that the compound will be modified into several variants, which means that the molecule might look similar, but the functional group might change its position. Like for example, the OH group might be at the first position and it will have an analog that will be moved to the second position, third position, fourth position, or it could be totally changed to a new functional group as well. So this might lead to a large chemical library. And so we could make use of such large chemical library of analog together with machine learning in order to develop a predictive model. And so the predictive model will allow us to predict the IC50 or the enzyme inhibition concentration. And so that will allow us to determine whether the specific location of the functional group or atoms or group of atoms are favorable at particular position or not. And machine learning will also allow us to 
determine what is the most important functional group in a molecule in the development of a potent drug molecule. Okay, and the subsequent step would be to perform admit or pharmacokinetic property analysis. And so pharmacokinetic will include the absorption property of the molecule, the distribution property, the metabolism, the excretion, and the toxicity. So all of this essentially means once a drug enters the human body, it could be by injection or by ingestion, how will it be absorbed by the body? How will it be distributed in the body? How will it be metabolized in the body? For example, by the cytochrome P450, or how will it be excreted from the body and whether the molecule will exert any toxicity to the body. Okay, so this is collectively known as the ATMET property. And then the next step would be to perform clinical phase one and two studies. And if that is passed, then it will essentially lead to the registration of the drug and also its eventual release to the market. So all of this collectively will be more than 10 years of work and it will be requiring more than $10 billion in order to discover one new FDA approved drug. So as you can see, the process of discovering a new drug is a very time consuming endeavor and it will be requiring large teams of scientists from academia and also from industry. And it will be requiring big financial budget in order to fund the various experimental assay target identification, in order to fund the high throughput screening experiment and countless other, particularly the clinical phase one and two, which will be also very costly. So all of this is a very big endeavor. And the thing is, if we are able to apply machine learning and AI in one of the processes required here or explained here, it will significantly allow us to learn from prior mistake and potentially accelerate the time at which we will be able to bring a drug to market. So in light of all of this explanation, one very lucrative approach in order to bring a drug to market fairly quickly would be something known as the drug repositioning or drug repurposing. So the concept of drug repositioning or drug repurposing is to take an existing FDA approved drug that have been proposed to be treating one disease and then we are going to be repurposing it for the treatment of another disease. Like for example, if a drug has been reported to be treating fungal disease, we might be repurposing it to treat breast cancer. And the reason being that the chemical structure of the target related to fungal disease will be similar to a target protein in breast cancer. And so that process is called drug repositioning. So that will allow us to bring a drug that is already approved by the FDA in order to find a novel indication in the treatment of a new disease. So it's kind of like you could say that it's teaching an old drug a new trick. Because the thing is, all of the possible experiments that could have been done, it's not done. Because for example, if you take a drug, you have tested against like, for example, 200 potential protein target, but then there are countless other, like 29,000 other target proteins that have never been tested against your compound. And so that is allowing big opportunity for a lot of the FDA approved drug to be potentially repurposed for the treatment of another disease. And so that is a very lucrative approach for computational drug discovery. And so maybe in the future videos, I will be showing you how you could do a drug repurposing experiment computationally using machine learning. Okay, and so that's the end of the first question. And let's take a look at the question number two. How do you think we can use data science in cancer research, especially at data management and validation? So the prior explanation that I have provided could be used for cancer research in terms of the therapeutic aspect, meaning to discover a new drug. So this question is asking how to use data science for data management. 
and validation. Okay. And so as you can see here, the drug discovery process encompasses several steps along the way. So all of this step will be generating massive amounts of data. So data could be in various form. It could be in the form of research papers in the literature. It could be supplementary information, supplementary data, uh, code and data set in the GitHub, gene sequences, protein sequences, peptide sequences, molecule structure of metabolized natural product. As you can see, all of this information are stored in various databases. And so in terms of the data management, I would envision that in order to make the data communicate or being interoperable, that is a big challenge. So in order to allow the data to flow interoperably from various sources of data, it will be meaning that you will be having to modify or prepare the data in order to make it suitable as an input to another software or program. And so as there are countless databases available pertaining to proteins, metabolite, interactomic, transcriptomic, genome, proteome, etc. So all of this will be quite heterogeneous. And so the big challenge here for data management is how do we allow all of this disparate sources or heterogeneous sources of data, how will we allow it to be interoperable? So I would believe that we could potentially harness the use of data engineering. And so that would allow the data to flow seamlessly, smoothly from one source to the other. And then we could apply data analytics and data science in order to make sense of such data. Okay. And so let's have a look at some of the community question. And so let's particularly select question related to bioinformatic in order to follow the theme of the bioinformatic ask me anything video. Okay, so Andrew from Data Leap is asking how often are easy to explain low complexity solutions chosen in the bio data field versus more cutting edge black box method. Okay, so that is a very great question, which I will be addressing now. So most of the research paper that we are recently publishing will be focusing on the use of interpretable machine learning algorithms. And so our favorite would be the random forest. And the great thing about random forest is that it requires fairly less time for training in order to obtain a robust model. And the built-in feature importance plot, particularly using the Gini index, is our favorite. However, it has some limitation in that it doesn't tell us which direction are the features for. Like for example, for which type of compounds are they favorable? Are they favorable for compounds that are active against the target protein? Or whether they are good or favorable for compounds that are inactive against the target protein of our interest. And so there are packages such as the Shapely or the SHAP library that will allow us to investigate the positive or negative contribution of each feature, molecular feature on the dependent variable, which is the, in our case, the IC50 value or the PIC50 value, which is the negative logarithmic transformed value of the IC50. And so let me show you, we have a book chapter about the interpretation of machine learning model. So the book title was Towards the Revival of Interpretable QSAR Models. Okay, so this is the book chapter that we have written. And so it is called the Towards the Revival of Interpretable QSAR Models. So QSAR are essentially quantitative structure activity relationship model where we apply machine learning in order to build a model that will be able to predict the biological activity of a set of compound. And so I could provide you the link to this book chapter in the description of this video. And so in this book chapter, we discuss the history of the field of QSAR and how the initial era was 
focus on developing interpretable models, but then with the advancement of machine learning and deep learning, the interpretability of the model become less and less because the prediction performance of the black box method was becoming higher and higher. However, in this chapter, we propose that we should also take into consideration using less accurate model, but then more interpretable model in order to allow biologists and biochemists to understand the features that are important for the observed biological activity, which will be able to drive their experiment further. Okay, and so let me see if there are any other question related to bioinformatics before we end this video. Okay, and so I guess that's all about bioinformatics. And so if you're finding value in this video, please give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you haven't yet done so. Hit on the notification button in order to be notified of the next video. And as always, the best way to learn data science is to do data science. And please enjoy the journey. Thank you for watching. Please like, subscribe, and share. And I'll see you in the next one. But in the meantime, please check out these videos.